Sure. Uh, I'm Elaine Stiles. I teach historic preservation here in the School of Architecture, Art and Historic Preservation, for those of you who uh, don't know me yet so far, who haven't uh, met me so far. Um, so I'm really pleased to introduce our speaker tonight, uh, because for more than 25 years, if you have been a preservation or an architectural prof architecture professional in the Northeast, and you've been interested in the preservation or conservation of modernism or resources from the more recent past, it's almost inevitable that you'll encounter and learn something uh, from our speaker tonight, David Fixler. As a preservation student and then a young professional, professional myself working in the region in the early 2000s, uh, David's education, advocacy, and awareness building for the preservation of these important buildings and landscapes was a welcome voice uh, for those of us who are interested in concrete and steel and suburban peripheries, as well as timber framing in center cities. So as he describes himself, David Fixler is an architect specializing in working with existing buildings, uh, something many of us in the room have an interest in as well. And as a, a graduate of the Columbia University Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation, he directed the efforts of two large firms on the conservation, renewal, and adaptive reuse of significant 18th, 19th, and 20th century properties prior to opening his own practice in the spring of 2017. Since the mid-1990s, these efforts have been particularly focused on the development of a critical framework and implementation strategies for the rehabilitation of 20th century modernism in the recent past. And his projects include work on an array of modern icons, uh, such as the rehabilitation of Alvar Aalto's Baker House and Eero Saarinen's Kresge Auditorium and Chapel, both at MIT. Lucan's Richards Laboratories at the University of Pennsylvania and the United Nations headquarters in New York City. David Fixler has also completed significant rehabilitation, expansion, and conservation planning projects for Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and Stanford universities, as well as for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, where he worked on the master plan for the Massachusetts State House. And in addition to his practice, uh, David Fixler teaches at the Harvard Graduate School of Design, has lectured around the world, and played a leading role in a variety of global conservation organizations, um, most notably the Association for Preservation Technology, the Society of Architectural Historians, and the best acronym of any preservation organization in the world, DOCO MOMO, <laughs> uh, which stands for Documenting and Conserving the Modern Movement. Uh, and his published works include a 2012 book on Alto in America, co-edited with Stanford Anderson and our very own Gail Fenske. Uh, so if you're an Alto fan, check that out. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome David Fixler. Thank you, Elaine. It is a, uh, it's a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to be able to uh, talk to you all about my, 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 my passion tonight. So what I'm going to ta talk about is I'm going to give you a little bit of a, just a sort of a, a background about, uh, about um, modern movement preservation. Um, and if, you, if any of you, if, if, it, if it seems like things you already know, just bear with me because it's sort of there setting a table. I'll talk a little bit about some of the, uh, the issues confronting the field of modern movement preservation. And then finally, I will give a case study on this building, uh, Louis Kahn's Richards Labs at the University of Pennsylvania. And we'll see what kind of time we have after that. So to start out with, um, this, this is, I, I like to start with these sort of combat combative images of the uh, Le Corbusier's Villa Savoie for a number of reasons. One is obviously it's an iconic modern building. Two, it, was, it fell into a state of deep decay, at which point Bernard Chumri proclaimed, right, now it's architecture. You know, all of the original meaning, all of the original purpose has been taken out of this. It is left to its raw essence. Is it architecture? It passes the test. It's architecture. And of course, because it, is, it was very early on, in about 1959, when it was in the condition that you see in Chumi's uh, photograph, uh, falling apart. And Le Corbusier actually uh, raised a hue and cry about this, saying, somebody has to look after my building. Hence the birth of modern preservation by, of course, someone who, as a young man, did his very best to deny history. But that's, that's how these things work. They, they, they come around. And in fact, the first official um, uh, recognition, sort of state recognition, of a modern landmark was another Le Corbusier building, the Unité d'Habitation. Uh, and it was declared in 1964, when it was at the a tender age of 12, uh, to be a national landmark by uh, Andre Malraux, 
who was then the French Minister of Culture. So, one of the, so this is obviously, not only is it important because it's a modern building, but it's important because it's only 12 years old. And this whole idea of the 50-year rule is one of the things that has been hotly debated for years uh, when, since, since the sort of growing uh, movement to preserve modernism has come along to saying we need to recognize these things early. And in this country, the first example of that was none other than, none other than the National Park Service uh, declaring Aero Saarinen's uh, Dulles Airport, which you see here actually in its expanded form, um, at the age of 18 uh, eligible for listing in the National Register and for to be considered for landmark status. So that's one of the, that's one of the first big things that, that's got sort of jumped out of the gun here is that the, uh, the, the idea that you don't have to wait and in many cases you can't wait till something is 50, especially because there is that what I believe the, uh, the heroic people call the ugly trough. When, when a building is typically 30, 40 years old, nobody likes it anymore. It's starting to really show its age and fall apart. And uh, it has the, the least chance for advocacy. So you've got to be very careful not to, let it, uh, not to let undue damage happen during that period. So let's talk a little bit about, get our terms straight here, modernism and modernity. Um, the modern movement was all about, uh, a, it was social, it was technical, and it was aesthetic, and how these things all come together was very important to consider when you're when you're when you're looking at modern buildings because they all play an equal an equal uh, role in 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 establishing significance. And I like to begin with uh, J.J. P. Oud's Keyfolk Housing in Rotterdam for two reasons. Um, one being that it is a it's an iconic modern building. Uh, it, it 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 has a strong social purpose. It's it's clearly um, uh, a, a aesthetically something new for 1930, and it, because it was technically experimental, uh, it also failed completely and utterly uh, technically, and consequently what you see here is actually a simulacrum. It is a rebuilding of the original comp, comp it, the rebuilding of the original complex. It is not the building itself. Now this, of course, as you might imagine. Uh, raised quite a hue and cry in the Netherlands where people are very purist about uh, in, in their positions whether uh, for or against but to walk around here and to experience this is is, is to sort of say well you know this is th this th this is really great but it it I guess the question really here is is it quote unquote authentic and authentic in the uh, in, in the words of uh, one of my co-editors for the Alto book, Stanford Anderson, who's also one of the great architectural historians of the 20th century, that's the third rail of architectural discourse. I mean, you can, you can, you can turn yourself into all kinds of knots when you start talking about authenticity. So the question really here is, uh, is it, however, a legitimate strategy? I leave that all up to you. I think it's a great point of discussion. Uh, I think it's great to be able to have this neighborhood there, but on the other hand, it's, uh, whether or not it, it makes itself sort of evident as being something that is in fact a recreation rather than the original uh, is a very real consideration. Um, staying in Rotterdam and looking at the, at, at the sort of celebration of technology, the Van Nella factory is a perfect example and I like to use this one because it's also been, it has undergone a very successful adaptive reuse by sort of dropping a building within the building which enables this very unsustainable thin uh, single glazed steel curtain wall skin to maintain, be maintained as it is because it would no longer is really critical to regulating the interior environment. So there's that, that, that's, a, that's a nice sort of, uh, uh, if you like, almost a knee-jerk strategy for making this kind of uh, renovation really work very well. And finally, um, the, of course, the, if you're looking at pure aesthetics, uh, where better to land than Mies van der Rohe's Barcelona Pavilion uh, with its free-floating planes and its uh, uh, use of, of beautiful materials uh, and really to create this sort of precious object. And of course, as you all know, uh, this also is a simulacrum. This is a, this because it was an exhibition pavilion. It was torn down after the close of the 1929 exhibition uh, in Barcelona. And but it was decided by the Spanish government in the 1980s that it would be great to recreate this. And it was recreated actually from photographs and very little in the way of drawing. So we're not even sure that what's there is really what was originally there. But it's certainly something very close. And again, it's a very pleasant thing to have. It's great to experience it. It's a great teaching tool for what it is. But it is, again, 
a, uh, you know, from the point of view of the sort of strict authenticity and the kind of guidelines that one is typically given when you're, when you're developing a, a, a philosophy of preservation, uh, it's a little out of the ordinary, which goes to show you that I think one of the most important things uh, that one needs to consider about preservation is there is no absolute right and wrong. There's no black, there's no white. It's all shades of gray somewhere in the middle. And anybody who tells you otherwise or pretends otherwise is deluding themselves because you're always going to be able to find an instance where that, that, that spectrum shifts. And it makes it interesting uh, as a practitioner to sort of find where the optimum uh, uh, pivot point is on any given project. So um, we'll back up for a second and remember, though, that it, we, I've been talking about is uh, sort of in orthodox preservation practice and what has defined that, what is, how it has evolved over the years. Here's a listing of some of the major charters. This is by no means uh, comprehensive of everything, but it, it hits the, uh, it hits sort of the major things and it doesn't even mention uh, the Secretary of the Interior Standards, which of course uh, begins to be developed in the 1960s and really gets codified in the 70s. But uh, the, um, the, the charters outlined or, or highlighted in orange are ones that were specifically designed to deal with modern properties. Uh, recognizing in the late 1980s that uh, there, were, there really were uh, things about modernism which potentially could be called different, um, a group of very enterprising young Dutch architects got together, formed this group called Dokomomo, uh, in Eindhoven and, uh, and, uh, and uh, produced a little charter called the Eindhoven Statement, which was modified to become the Eindhoven Sole Statement to bring in a whole uh, raft of sustainability guidelines along with it to basically s talk about the fact that modern heritage was, was important, it was unique, and it was something worth sustaining. But I think one of the things that distinguishes uh, Dokomomo, and I think distinguishes a lot of the people who work on modern buildings, is that not only is this about preserving a kind of heritage which typically is viewed in the traditional charters as the other. And remember that the whole idea of preservation is really itself a modern construct. This idea that, um, that we live in the modern world, and there was a world before that, which was a world that we need to honor and curate and take good care of. But it is a world that we are now no longer a part of. Hence the idea in, in all of these charters that when you're adding to a traditional building, you should do it in something that is of the time you are adding it, not of the time uh, when the original building was built. So that, that whole idea is, is one thing. And when you, when, you, when you then translate that to modern properties, it gets a little more, it gets a little fuzzier because many people are still using language which is still very much like what these buildings were, and making that distinction becomes a much finer line uh, than it is in, say, adding to uh, an 18th century town hall or a church or something like that. So that, that, that's one thing. And, uh, and, as the, it all, and then as the sort of technical idea, the technical issues have come up, um, things like the, the Icamos Madrid document and the APT principles for renewing modernism get into more of the uh, larger issues, both from a technical and from a, a uh, larger heritage standpoint, like urban heritage standpoint, as to how to deal with these properties, uh, and especially the ones which don't necessarily rise to the level of the icons. Uh, one group that's been very active in this and, uh, and has put out a lot of literature and also initiatives towards really documenting and, uh, and, and developing conservation plans uh, for these buildings is the Getty Conservation Institute. And I had the good fortune to be part of their, in their Conserving Modern Architecture Initiative, uh, to be a recipient of one of their first grants for uh, doing a conservation management plan uh, for the Jewett Art Center. So this is, a way, this is a way of bringing some real conservation discipline, but with a healthy dose of flexibility to, to looking at some of these complexes, understanding that they're going to need to change and that by doing a conservation management plan, one can, one can do that in a way that can be well managed. Uh, one of the uh, most comprehensive and complete uh, of these was done for Alvaro Alto's Pamio Sanatorium. Now, in some ways, Pamio is a little easier because the, um, the, they don't envision a change in use which would require any sort of a major reworking of the building. It's really, in a way, almost a museum uh, at this point. Um, but 
it is nonetheless, it, it nonetheless gives you a great set of curation guidelines uh, for how to work with this building from the sort of day-to-day -day maintenance to the much larger issues. Now, sometimes you don't have the luxury of spending two years doing a conservation management plan and you are also dealing with a commercial property. And this is an example of a property that I worked on up in Regina, Saskatchewan. It is a uh, it is called the, the, the most important Brazilian modern office building in Canada because it's got this curvy shape, so they call it Brazilian modern. But it is actually a very interesting building. And this is an example of what I call sort of a high quality but ordinary uh, modern building. Uh, something that there, there are hundreds if not thousands of around the world that, that deserve a, a, attention, deserve to be treated well, but we, go, we have to accept the fact that they're going to be uh, they're, they're, they're going to be uh, they're altered. And in four months, I gave them a plan that they could work with so that they could give that then to the building renovation architects who had been stopped by the local heritage authority saying, we consider this building to be important and you're not going to touch it until you get a conservation management plan in hand. Uh, and we were able to help sort of steer that to a more uh, um, more sanguine solution to, 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 to something uh, where the changes that they made were much more in sympathy uh, with the original architecture of the building. And then sometimes you even do little, these sort of little uh, workshops, uh, sort of even conservation management charrettes like we did uh, for Alvar Alto's San Yatsolo Town Hall after it was announced that it was going to be essentially disposed of as, as surplus property by the city of San Yatsolo because there or the town of San Yatsolo because it no longer had it was no longer going to be a town it was going to be subsumed into the larger municipality of Javascola and so this became surplus property so the efforts are afoot to uh, to try to find a good use for this and this of course being a world heritage quality building this is not a building you take lightly but nonetheless the the even in a building like this the idea that of going in and looking quickly and being able to formulate even the, the, the roughest set of an outline of guidelines is very useful in determining a position uh, so that going forward nothing, nothing negative happens to the building. But is this really different than what we do with any property? So let's run down a few of these things and uh, look at material and idea. Uh, the, uh, the, the notion that because so many of these buildings were built of experimental materials or very thin materials that are prone to failure and often cannot be restored or not easily restored. So is then the idea of what the, the architect's intention or the architect and building owner's intention, was? does that take priority? And is that what you honor when you go back to restore the building and not worry so much about the material? Uh, the value of change. Modernism is a dynamic phenomenon. It's all, it's all about change. It's all about, it, it's, it's not about standing still. It's about constantly progressing and looking to the future. And so honoring that as a character defining feature of you like, of the building itself. The importance of technology, the celebration of technology, both in the material and in the process of making it. Um, character defining features, I just kind of sort of went through, but newness value. Uh, if, if you look back at Alois Regal and uh, all of his, his, his modern cult of monuments. He tacks on at the end after using age value, hist historic value, and use value, he adds newness value. And newness value is the idea that once, it, that when something sort of loses its sheen, um, it, it also loses some value. Now, in most traditional buildings, that's just seen as acquiring patina. And the question is, how, how well can, it, can a modern building acquire patina? I would maintain that many modern buildings do acquire patina. It's not the kind of patina we're used to, but it is a patina nonetheless. Uh, but nonetheless, it is, it is the, I mean, if you compare it to an industrial object like a car, a car is much more valuable when it looks new than when it has patina. So, and then, of course, this issue that I mentioned of the temporal and aesthetic proximity, the fact that we are close in both time and if you like design philosophy, at least aesthetic design philosophy, so that these, this kind of fungibility of style. Dokomomo has been uh, working diligently, as I mentioned, since 1988 on sort of sorting this out. And their first project, the thing that really kicked them off, was uh, the uh, Zonestral Sanatorium, um, at which looked in 1988 very much like what you see there on the left. Uh, and, uh, and, and then under, had undergone, and then the building on the right had undergone a, had undergone a very bad uh, restoration. So these, 
these architects in raising this hue and cry set out to try to find a way to um, use this as a, uh, as a demonstration tool, if you like, for what could be done to save what they felt was a very important piece of Dutch history. And here again, what you see here is by and large a simulacrum. I mean, it is the original frame, but all of the finishes, the windows, the systems, they're all new. I mean, it's, they, so you are, they, they, this is a, it, it, and it's, it's superbly done. It is a, it, it is a, it is a beautiful uh, uh, restoration, if you like, but very little original fabric outside of the, uh, outside of the raw concrete frame of the original building was able to be salvaged. And again, take that for what it, for, for what you will. It is a, uh, it, it, it's a very interesting monument, but it's not, it's hard to sort of take this and say, this is an example for how to do a large number of buildings going forward. It really becomes kind of a museum piece. So again, these, there are these, this is not to criticize the efforts of the architects who did this because they did a superb job. It's, but, it, well, but what it does point out is that when you're looking to do a lot of these kinds of things, uh, you often have to make judgment uh, calls which might not enable you to do something quite as precious as this was done. And the, the other thing, of course, is the, there were no real sustainability upgrades. I mean, they, they put in more high-performance systems, but it's still, it's still single glazed, it's still uninsulated. So again, from an environmental standpoint, these are things that now really have to be factored in to a much greater degree on most any building except the ones that are, mo that are, that are really at the, the sort of top end of the landmark status. And we'll get into that when I talk about the Richards Labs. Um, and here again, uh, Alvar Alto's uh, Vipere Library, the, the beautiful, um, beautiful wood ceiling that you see there on the left and the restored version uh, uh, on the right below. Again, it's all, it all had to be taken down and rebuilt. They were not able to salvage, e even in this case, the original wood ceiling. It had become so degraded through, uh, through water infiltration. Um, so these are, these, these are things you just sort of have to accept. But thinking about the challenges and the necessity of looking at these uh, buildings, especially the, the sort of broader uh, urban fabric that, and that, that, that we're dealing with, a couple things to point out. Between 1945 and 1980, uh, all of the, we doubled the amount of building that had been put on the earth. And since then, we've probably doubled it again. So we're dealing with an awful lot of buildings of the recent past uh, that are going to be coming due for renovation. Uh, and I think, w w and so what this really talks about is uh, the, the necessity for coming up with uh, not only uh, a philosophy and guidelines and attitudes, but really just sort of inculcating with people that from a resource, a resource use standpoint, every effort should be made to save as many buildings as we can. I mean, you can't save everything. It's not worth saving everything. But, um, it also, is, it, we, it also means that we can't treat every building as a sort of precious preservation project. And that's what the APT principles for modernism, which I'll show you later, uh, talk, are starting to talk about. And this is something that we very much have in development at the moment, because it's a hard thing to do, to basically write a charter that says, you can treat buildings in a fairly robust fashion. You should, you should apply a preservation ethos, but that doesn't mean that you can't change things. It's a, again, it's a, it's that grayscale, and not everybody not everybody's comfortable with that. So the main cha major challenges there's a lot of it. Uh, there is the balance of character retention and the improvement of performance, particularly for, from an energy use standpoint. Uh, the educational challenge of promoting an understanding uh, and appreciation. I think there we've come a long way in the last 20 years. I think that there are a lot more people. Uh, find this fashionable, and it, frankly, it's getting older. I think that that's helping it. The fact that it is, it's it's becoming it's in itself more historic. Uh, and then this affirmation of the human skill. This is a big issue, particularly in buildings built in the later part of the modern movement, the the, the more brutalist kinds of buildings and things like that, where they often didn't meet the street in very friendly ways. And I think the the idea that you you need to create a more fine grain interface with the with the public in many of these buildings uh, to really make them work. Then, of course, there are the technical challenges. And I won't go down all these. I'll just say you can, you, you, you can look at what we've got up there. But I think that there, there are things that you're, you're, you're not, uh, shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. 
But you know, the last thing is, the last couple things is that the unsympathetic changes over time uh, tend to um, sort of uh, get extrapolated in, into, to make small problems, big problems. And facilities people sort of throw up their hands and, uh, and, 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 and don't, know, don't often know what to do with these things in order to, uh, uh, to come up with a sympathetic solution. So very often, it just means trying to get yourself back to square one. You know, if you, if, you can, if you can just get the building back to where it was when it began and use that as a starting off point, you've usually solved about half the problem. So a typical challenge might be curtain walls. And here are two examples of uh, different approaches to, uh, to a curtain wall restoration. Building on the left is a uh, is the Celebrezzi building in uh, in Cleveland. It is a uh, GSA property uh, owned by the General Service Administration, who are one of the best, biggest landlords in the country, and also one of the ones who are most interested in developing these uh, these principles for renewing modernism because they've got a lot of these buildings which aren't particularly distinguished, but they don't want to throw out. They want to treat properly, but they don't want to be too precious with. And so hitting that sweet spot is very important to them. And for instance, in this case, they determined that the best way to make this building more sustainable and serve their needs was to overclad it. So the middle photo is actually a new skin that was dropped over uh, the original building and uh, makes it much more energy efficient and enables them to uh, enables them to run this building uh, a, as a much more um, a much more uh, profitable energy energy efficient and uh, pleasant environment to be in now on the right what you see is the uh, lever house by Skidmoorings in Maryland New York of course one of the first curtain wall buildings in the United States and in the world and it, what you see there is a new curtain wall that is an exact replication of the original. So this again, this is another simulacrum. This is, a, this is an instance where they just took down the original curtain wall and put back something that looks the same, but is a much, much higher performance system. It, 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 has, um, it has all of the contemporary bells and whistles as far as glazing and weepage. Uh, it is very well insulated. They, they were more successful in how they dealt with the uh, spandrel panels, the areas right in, whoops, let's go back. Uh, green, yeah, okay, right here. That used to just be a piece of clear glass with a shadow box, which means just a very dark painted CMU wall behind it. And it would get up to about 200 degrees in there and start to sort of fry things around it and cause distortions and leakage uh, in the curtain wall. So they found a way to ventilate that and to make it uh, actually work as part of the, uh, the uh, um, physics of, the, uh, of that curtain wall system. So again, Paul Goldberger, uh, the former New York Times architecture critic and someone who's written for The New Yorker and many others, he wrote a long article for Preservation Magazine about this when this came, when this was finished in the early 2000s basically making the same argument, saying, is this preservation or isn't it? And there's, you know, everybody has to sort of come to their own conclusion about that. You, you sort of make up your own mind as to what's important. So the other big thing that we're dealing with, of course, with modern buildings and is of, of uh, particular uh, importance these days is concrete. And I like this, uh, I, I, I picked out this quote from, um, uh, the, from really, I picked it out because it was in Colin Rowe's introduction to his essay on Le Corbusier's La Tourette, which of course is the building illustrated here, um, to talk about the, uh, the qualities of concrete as a visual and tactile material. And in particular, uh, to you know, stress the importance of concrete as a natural material. In a way, I mean, it's synthetic, but when I say natural, I mean unpainted, so that you, you, can, you can read the, there, and there's, this, it's, it's, there's an amazing difference, because I think you, you see you get the, the little white hints of the, um, uh, in, in the photograph on the right, where uh, some painting was done, and it is very, it's, I, I don't really know why they have painted this building, but if you look here, you can, you can see very clearly the difference between the painted surface there on the left and what it was before on the right, and why the, and how it has kind of flattened the building, besides the fact of making it sort of look striped, it has flattened the building in a way which takes a lot of the life out of the concrete. And I think there's a, be, because, and it, it also uh, highlights 
uh, just how different the different kinds of concrete that you see elsewhere uh, in this photo, the different um, textures and uh, colors and all of the variation that goes along with that. Uh, I did a concrete restoration project on Boston City Hall, and even as a public bid project, we had 30 different colors of concrete just to patch the different areas because there is so much variation in that. And it's really, really hard to patch concrete well. And the, the fact is, of course, concrete, it, it, whether you paint it or not, uh, it, moisture will get into it, and there will be a, eventually through a process of carbonation as it hits the reinforcing steel, uh, if you don't do something to counter, if the steel is not protected and you don't do something to counteract it, there will be, um, there will be rusting, and rusting produces expansion, which, which pops pieces of the concrete off, and you have to do things like this on this IMP building, and never call an IMP building brutalist. Uh, he hated that term. Uh, but, uh, on this, but he loved concrete, and there you, you see uh, what has happened over the years uh, with these patches, which matched very well when they were first uh, put in, but over time, uh, depending upon what the weather was and, you know, and how much water was in the mix and any one of a number of things that might ultimately affect the way the concrete dries and hence colors, uh, this is, it's a, it is a real, it's an art, it's something that the Getty Conservation Institute is paying a lot of it, uh, attention to these days and very much wants to um, sort of develop, you know, advance the science of this. There are a lot, lot, of, lot of very good people working on this, but it's, um, uh, it, it is, uh, it, it's something that is very labor intensive and uh, is much art as it is science, as you might, might expect. Other kinds of materials we're dealing with are things like these glass reinforced uh, polyester, fiberglass, essentially panels. This is James Sterling's uh, Olivetti Hasselmere wing, and you can see the, um, the distortion in these, these panels right here. And again, this is not something that is easily uh, repaired or restored, although there are people who are, who are looking into the, uh, the science of trying to find a way to repair this. But ultimately, uh, it, it, is, it is a panel produced by an industrial process, and, the, and the, by far the simplest thing to do, if you can find the industrial process that made it to begin with, is just to go back and make some more of them. Uh, and so that, and, and consequently, that's, uh, that, 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 is, that is what they're trying to do here. Uh, but I also like to show this building because it shows a sort of fetishization, if you like, of, uh, of systems behind the, uh, behind the curtain wall there and the fact of, that building systems really become very much a part of the architecture. And in this next example, the Wellesley College Science Center uh, in Wellesley, Massachusetts, uh, you have both the uh, celebration of technology here and the, in the, the strobic fans on the roof of the building, but also in uh, a, another polymer, which is Calwall, right here, all of this stuff right here. Uh, which actually, I, I would maintain, it, this, this, is a, this is an early photo uh, when the cow wall was still white. Over the years, it turned yellow, and much to Wellesley's chagrin and much to cow wall's chagrin. Uh, I actually think it made it look, it, it gave it a warmth and kind of an interesting quality. And the, in tandem with the concrete, because one of the things that happens to concrete as the carbonation process occurs is that it also gets a, a warmer color. And as a matter of fact, if I just go back for a second to the um, to this, um, the uh, the warmth that you see in this uh, th th this was a gr it was a grayer concrete 20 years ago than it is now. It, it kind of as the the process of carbonation uh, gives it in, a, in 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 a strange way a patina, which also makes the patching that much more difficult too because the patches themselves will change color over time and what are you trying to match? It's like trying to match uh, uh, weathered wood. So, uh, so there, unfortunately, uh, and this is where, this is where the, the building codes often come in, uh, as they went to renovate this building, they were told by the building inspector in the town of Wellesley that they couldn't use the cow wall anymore because it, it, it is, ironically enough, it was chosen originally uh, for fire protection reasons, they, they had to use it instead of an, a, another material 45 years ago. And now it is deemed a threat. It is deemed to be uh, um, a, uh, a threat because apparently when it does, it, if it actually gets to the point where it burns, it gives off gases from the plastic and the polymers. So they have to go back and replace it with something else. And this is, this is again something that uh, 
that, that bedevils a lot of modern buildings, especially ones that were made with asbestos cement board or transite panels, which, is, which was very frequent between the, between the 1950s and the early 1970s, and obviously those all have to come out, which means that you, there, there's really no argument about what you do with them. So um, one of the things that, so I want to talk a little bit about sustainability and re resilience and program fit. And uh, modern architecture is often accused of being sort of insens environmentally insensitive. And while it's true that many of the buildings were not well insulated and used a lot of fuel, there was a certain amount of sensitivity, however, to orientation uh, and to using the sun and to, re and to really designing sensitively with nature, uh, particularly at the domestic scale. And, and you see in this uh, New England Solar House by Carl Koch and a Mc the McNeil Passive Solar House by O'Neill Ford in San Antonio in Texas. Um, and a lot of this was because of fuel shortages and just pure comfort. I mean, people typically, uh, at least in this part of the world, uh, until the 1960s or 70s, did not air condition houses. I live in a modern house that was built in the early 1950s. And all of the overhangs are calculated so that you get sun coming in in the winter, and it stays out in the summer, and it stays remarkably cool, the way that the plantings were done around it and everything else. It's not perfect, but there, there was attention to that, and I want to uh, just remind people that it, particularly uh, even in larger buildings, a, uh, a building like this, the El Panama Hotel in Panama City by Edward Durrell Stone, actually uh, in 19, uh, the early 1950s there was an article in Life magazine about this and they trumpet its sustainability, the fact that the, the, the use of, uh, of the balconies and through breezes and things like that as means of natural cooling of the structure. So it isn't something that we have invented in our time and that the moderns were unaware of, although I will confess that there was this period, which I kind of call the period of architectural amnesia, from about the mid-60s to about 1980, where an awful lot of buildings were built that really were, really just didn't pay attention to g getting in good natural light, didn't pay attention to energy use, didn't pay attention to a lot of things. And uh, why that happened, I'm not really sure, but we, we, are, we are living with the results of that and having to, to work with them every day. Um, in the planning of the United Nations, Le Corbusier originally wanted to put Brice Soleil on, his, uh, on, on the glazing of the Secretariat, and here you see his proposal for a green roof on the General Assembly. So again, these things were, were very much in people's minds even 50, 60 years ago, 70 years ago almost now. Um, from a the idea, of so much of uh, the mantra of sustainability when you're looking at uh, at looking at, at, older, at, at these older mid-century buildings is they were energy efficient, therefore we need to take them down and either, either rebuild them or do something completely different. And that's, that's very much the argument of this mid-century on modern thing, although they're, they're, they, are, they fault these buildings not only for energy reasons, but for reasons of column base sizing and floor to floor heights, saying you can't do class A office space. So they're but consequently, what they're advocating is tearing down millions of square feet of otherwise perfectly good space. So I think there's, there's, a, there's a certain amount of pushback that's been going on with this. But a lot of this comes, too, from the, the, the initiative uh, promulgated by the, the Bloomberg administration, which isn't bad in itself, to densify even to an even greater degree the area around Grand Central Station. And that's really what is what has, has uh, predicted this. Now, what the image on the right is all about is uh, the, what, what typically happens in, in Washington, D.C., where this building has, has had its original facade stripped off, and they're putting up a unitized curtain wall system. Now, one of the things about a unitized curtain wall system is it is a hermetically sealed uh, unit. It is something that is... Uh, that you take from the shop and you clip it onto, onto your structural frame in the field and you walk away. And as soon as the seals break on the, on the glass on the inside, you have to take the whole thing off and throw that away and replace it. So it is inherently, in that sense, um, the sustainability is questionable, you might say, because there really is a, the, you, you are really putting up a facade with a limited lifespan that you don't have a means of repairing. There are people who are starting to work on solutions to this, who are starting, starting to try to, f to develop facades that can be taken apart and rebuilt. And there's not 
uh, there, there is precedent for that. And one precedent there right in Washington, D.C., is this building that I worked on uh, back around 2000. This is the International Union of Operating Engineers. And this is both an interesting technical and a philosophical pr issue because you see the building there on the, uh, on the upper left. Uh, that's the original um, uh, building by Holabird Root and Bergie, the young John Bergie, who went on to become uh, Philip Johnson's partner. Uh, built in the late 1950s and in a very typical 1950s kind of green glass, okay? So over time, the building uh, by, by the late 1990s needed a lot of work, and, but what the owners really wanted is they wanted a new look. They say, this looks tired, it looks dated, we want, we want, we want to reskin this building, we want to put a new skin on the building. So we looked at a whole bunch of different options, but what we discovered when we went in and looked at that curtain wall, at the, the, the stick system in the curtain wall, is in fact, uh, it was stainless steel. It's pretty robust. And because it was stick built, which means that you put the framing members up and then you glaze the glass into it, into the field, rather than having that done in the factory, we were able to take the original glass out, fit an insulated glass unit in there, weep the system, and because it was sufficiently strong to hold that, it, it all kind of held together. So it's not perfect. You don't have a thermal break in the framing, but the glass itself is insulated and um, it performs to a much higher degree. The compromise that we settled on with the owner is we went from green glass to blue glass. He said, okay, we'll give, you, we'll give you a newer look with this contemporary blue glass. And since you need a whole lot of work done on the penthouse and want to add some space up there, we will give you that new little cornice piece that you see up at the top. So they were satisfied, that, and, and a new entry. We, we redid the entry. But we were able to save much, much more of the building uh, than the owners originally thought they would save. Uh, they, 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 it, this was not their idea going in, but they were perfectly happy coming out. And I think this kind of attitude is uh, hopefully what is gonna start to inform more and more projects uh, like this. I, I wish I had a lot more examples to cite to you, but uh, it's, it's something that's coming. Um, preservation's a design discipline, and I think one of the places where that comes out is looking at the, uh, the interventions and additions that, are, that, are, that, uh, that have happened with a, with a lot of modern buildings and, and talking both about uh, their successes and their difficulties. I won't call this a failure. This is the Yale Art and Architecture Building by Paul Rudolph Hall, as it's called now. Uh, the renovation by uh, Guacme Siegel and Associates. The photo on the left is the, uh, or the photo is the, uh, that's the building as it was built and opened in the mid-1960s. Um, this is the plan of what's there today. And what, what you can see here, the Rudolph's building basically stops about right around at that line. And essentially, this addition enables Rudolph's building to remain pretty much untouched and be, to, to be restored. Because there's so much in Rudolph's building in terms of um, clearances for stairways, elevator access, uh, because there are many different floor levels, uh, the different sectional aspects, um, bathrooms, all kinds of things that you simply, that to bring up to code without an addition, you would take much of the primary space out of the building. So this, this addition that, that goes off to the side, which holds offices and bathrooms and fire stairs and all kinds of other things like that, as well as uh, some classroom space, uh, really enables the, uh, the, the building to, to have a nice restoration. So here you see the addition, which I think actually works pretty well on the back here. Uh, the front is less successful. I think this, this points up the difficulties of working with certain kinds of buildings. I think Paul Rudolph's buildings are right up there in terms of the, the challenges of what it takes to, to add to them because you, 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 it's, it's folly to mimic what he did. Uh, but yet when you try to come up with something that plays off it as a contrast, it's a little, it, it, it can be tough to sort of find just the right language. Although I do think that this, uh, this rear elevation here, which is not the one that you typically see as, a, as the public on this building, uh, actually works pretty well. And it does enable a beautiful restoration inside. Uh, and uh, you know, they, they, you can you can tell by the, uh, the there are you know there are certain certain accommodations that one 
I need to make for ADA, which aren't strictly speaking met here, but, the, but you're able by compensating in other areas to be able to make the building work to code. And the other thing that they did was they went hog wild on um, sustainability strategies for this to try to make it um, uh, to, to try to make it as high an energy performer as possible. Uh, they were able to put in very high performance windows, but they did some really ingenious things uh, with, the, with the building systems and with being able to find clever ways to introduce daylight into the building, which are a lot to be commended and really should be a model for, um, uh, for more buildings of this nature. However, I have to say, um, one of the reasons that this building is as successful as it is is because the Yale decided that they were, I won't say spare no expense, but they, they certainly put an, an inordinate amount of resources into this to make sure that they got something that was really of the highest quality. Speaking of Paul Rudolph, I don't know how many of you are aware uh, that this, th this has hit the press in the last week, but um, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts is uh, going to be, not yet happening, but it's going to be sometime later next year, sending out a uh, request for proposal to do some work on this. But this is, this is where, this, this is the hazards of preservation. Um, you can see they, it, it, reading this article, you would think this entire site is being torn down. Uh, and A, the building that you see here, the one, of course, prominently featured, this is the Lindemann building. Nothing's happening to that building. That building's staying regardless, no matter what happens to the rest of the site. Uh, and will eventually be, something will be restored or re repurposed, but it will stay essentially as is. This building here, which is this building here, the Hurley building, um, the state wants to do some sort of redevelopment with. But the idea that it will be, uh, that it will be torn down is by no means a done deal. I, I, they're uh, going to be exploring options for uh, lots of other different ways to go about this, which may, uh, which may save uh, considerable parts of that. The main issue here is that this is a site that's very underbuilt, and they want to take advantage of an FAR that was built into the site a long time ago, uh, because originally, there was a tower, which I don't actually have a picture of, but there was a tower that was meant to go right here, 23 stories tall, never got built. Uh, they built a courthouse here instead. And, uh, in, and the, the state badly needs office space, so they're, they're looking to do some development in here. And there was a very good studio at Wentworth a few years back that Mark Pasnick and Carol Burns ran that actually looked at some proposals for uh, what that might mean to sort of meld the architecture of the, of the Hurley building and some new development in there. So it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. But you're going to be hearing a lot about this in the months and years ahead. Here's again the, uh, it, it's obviously a, a stunning building. This is, this is in the Lindemann building. That's the chapel. That's another view of the Lindemann building. This is largely the Hurley building here. And of course, it's Rudolph's characteristic rib concrete, the same concrete that he used at the art and architecture building. And it has its, um, it is in many ways a sinister building, and, uh, it, and especially when you consider that this particular part of the building, and this with, with the frog leering over the, the entrance there, was uh, is for developmentally challenged people who are, you know, whose minds work in, in strange ways. So it, it was a, but I think the, uh, the that nature was very well, ni very nicely captured in The Departed. For those of you who are familiar with Scorsese's film. Um, but there's a, there's a lot of brutalist buildings are under very real threat, and I won't, and I won't try to minimize the threat that's potentially there with the, uh, with, with the government services building. But um, the Apprentice Women's Hospital we fought long and hard for, uh, and in the end, they could not come up with a, uh, a, a viable use that was acceptable to the owner, Northwestern University, although some brilliant, ingenious schemes such as this one by uh, studio gang uh, done in concert with Michael Kimmelman, the architecture critic uh, uh, for the uh, Chicago Tribune at the time, came up with this this very very interesting scheme, which I actually think is is beautiful. And this is again, this is an idea saying, listen, you're never gonna you're never gonna let this building is never gonna be viable on its own like this. So much like the state may want to do with the uh, government services building in Boston, why not why not put something on top of it? use it as a podium, and uh, have some fun. So this is, this is not your grandfather or grandmother's preservation, certainly. But, it's, uh, but on the other hand, it, 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 it is a way of thinking about 
creatively adapting and reusing buildings which otherwise are very difficult to adapt. And in that spirit, uh, the, there has not been a lot of overt change, but there's been some, some fairly uh, substantial reworking of the public spaces in the Barbican, it, they, that little photo on the upper left shows. But one of the things that the Barbican has done so beautifully over the years is that they've, they've gone through a long conservation management planning process and have developed really good design guidelines for how to uh, sort of live and work and play in this enormous complex. I don't know if you are familiar with it. I, I don't know if 20, 30,000 people or so live, live in this complex. It's, it's a huge, huge complex in, the, in East London and very poetic. It's some of, the, some of the nicest concrete architecture you'll encounter anywhere and now very fashionable, of course. But, the, um, it, but it's, it's sort of balancing the need for, for change and upkeep and uh, with, with hanging on to the essential character of what this thing is. So uh, a reminder about looking at additions. We're going to look at a few more additions. The Secretary of the Interior Standards, Standard 9, this is what I mentioned earlier, that, the, that there, there should be a distinction. That you, now, we're getting pushback about that. There are people like my, my former um, graduate school classmate, Stephen Seams, uh, who runs the Notre Dame program, who says, well, wait a minute, you know, for thousands of years, people did buildings and then they went back 200, 300, 400 years later and they did an addition and it looks the same. And it's, 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 it's subtle differences, but, you know, you don't necessarily have to be of your time. You can be of the building's time and just sort of extend that across. And there's a growing cadre of professionals that prefer to work that way these days, uh, even though they are, um, they may be preservationists and challenging that that sort of essential doctrine. And again, what that is a challenge to is really this whole idea of, of modernity saying we are, a, we are a new, distinct, and forever different epoch in history. Everything that came before us is the other, and we will treat it with respect, but it's the other. And this is an idea that is more, and, and that, that, that history, or history, rather than being something that is linear and progressive, the sort of Hegelian idea of the, the history moving along a continuum, is something that cycles back on itself, and it's really more of a field. And that's, these are very interesting philosophical uh, uh, issues to, to dive into if you've ever got the time. Uh, and it, it can make your head spin, certainly. So the, um, I wanted to point out, though, an, a, uh, an, an example of a fairly robust addition here to, um, uh, to O'Neill Ford's uh, uh, Trinity University in San Antonio, Texas, uh, that was done by my former partner, Paul King at EYP. So here you have uh, a building by, by Ford, and over here, a piece of a building by Ford. And in the, right in here used to be an old power plant. And we sort of, this is a way of sort of doing some strategic selective demolition of underutilized buildings and putting in signature pieces with this little sustainable garden in front, but something that is meant to sort of blend these pieces together in a way that, uh, that, is, that is sympathetic to the language that Ford was using, but still distinctive of our time. And I think there's, there's enough in there that's, that, that, that is new uh, and, and different uh, that no one's ever going to um, uh, make that distinction. But it's, but it's trying to use uh, Ford's architecture to its best, to its best uh, degree, to sort of coax the best out of it. Uh, on the other hand, um, the project we did for uh, GE up in Schenectady, where they, again, they, newness value, they, 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 they wanted a showpiece for their, uh, their own sustainable design initiative, so uh, we dropped this very sustainable new skin over the building and built an atrium here around a windmill to sort of showcase that as a, a little um, uh, demonstration area uh, for this building. So it doesn't really look anything like what's there before, but it is a it's a successful adaptive reuse of a building it get, that gives it a whole new identity. Um, Boston uh, University, uh, Bruno Cotta has been doing a lot of work on Jose Luis Sert's legacy. This is the BU Law School Tower by Sert. This is, and then this is his uh, library and the student center. And what, the, what they were hired to do was basically to make this building work, which it hadn't for a long, long time. It was a very, very dysfunctional building. And they did it by adding an addition. And that addition is what you see here next to the, and, and then with a, uh, they, they created a winter garden entrance. And this is the, 
kind of example of what I was talking about of um, the mitigation, the human scale mitigation, creating, creating um, spaces for people to come in and out of the building which are warm and welcoming and generous and gracious rather than just being a little hole in the wall, which is uh, all too often what these were to begin with. For some reason, there were a lot of modern architects didn't really care how you got into their buildings, including, um, go, including this guy, Louis Kahn. Uh, and this was a, but this was a, a, a fantastic project for me and for my, uh, my team. And basically, what, uh, what, what, what this involved was taking one of the uh, most important buildings of the second half of the 20th century and one of the most dysfunctional buildings ever designed by anyone, uh, and to try to take those two things and uh, get rid of the dysfunction and make it work. This building was called by David Baltimore, a uh, Nobel Prize winning physicist, the worst laboratory ever designed anywhere. Um, and it wasn't entirely Louis Kahn's fault, but uh, they were, there, was, there, were, there was a lot in play there uh, suffice to say, but it was, uh, uh, nonetheless, we had to fix it. So the basic uh, uh, schema of the building is, you see here, here it is when it was first built before they put on the Goddard Labs, which kind of extended it off in this direction. But this is the original complex right here. This is the old Penn campus. And interestingly enough, at the time, Kahn was a student at the University of Pennsylvania. The architecture school was right here. So he spent years looking at that site. Uh, not knowing what would uh, eventually be in store for him. And as I say, I, I think this is a great quote from, uh, um, from Lou up at the top about why he did what he did. He thought, he thought scientists were like architects and liked to work in big open spaces. And so he designed these trays, these glazed trays, so that you could look across and across the space of the tray itself and from one tray into the next. When in fact, they all wanted little cubby holes, but, and even Vincent Scully, who's the one who called this one of the most important buildings of the 20th century. A town of colleagues, but in a material sense, they function not perfectly at all. So if you look at the, um, the plan I have here is sort of, this is an idealized plan. And the, the pink are the, um, are, are the Richards Towers that pinwheel, you see these three glazed towers that pinwheel around a solid brick service towers. This used to be an animal holding area for experiments and then uh, it, all of the other sort of core functions and then the labs like this. And this is the way Kahn envisioned it without lots of partitions inside. And then these are the, these are the Goddard Laboratory additions which were also done by Kahn but Penn was so, um, thing, a lot of things went wrong with the project in construction and, and Penn was so frustrated towards the end that they actually fired Kahn before this was finished, and consequently, the, there, there, there are a lot of the architectural moves that were, that were eventually carried out there really don't come up to what happened in the original building because Kahn did not have control of it up to the very end. It's interesting to look at the way he, he kind of thought this through, though, and what, what his major concerns were. Uh, this is his first real uh, um, serious exploration of uh, exposed reinforced concrete structure, and it's also his first real look at what to do at uh, bringing large volumes of air uh, and exhausting large volumes of air uh, out, of, out of a laboratory structure. And the funny thing about Kahn is there, you, 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 you see things like this, like these arches and these very, very, uh, and the, the, the sort of very, very literal moment, moment diagram of these cantilevered uh, Virendil frames off of these posts uh, in his early explorations. The structural engineer for this, uh, the design structural engineer, was August Commandant. And Commandant worked with Kahn from this point through to the end of his career. But this was their first collaboration together. And it was also um, the time when Kahn was most under Commandant's spell. So I think that, that that's one of the reasons that this building is so much about structure, is he really wanted to, he wanted that, that to, 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 to sort of emphasize uh, the, uh, the, 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 the power and, and potential of these reinforced concrete cantilevered frames. Uh, and then, of course, you see these huge exhaust uh, banks of ducts on either side of that, uh, li uh, sort of literally adding e e with every floor, getting more and more and more uh, as they go up to the roof. 
So this is, this is uh, in, in schematic design. And then here on the, on the plan, you, get, you, you can see this is in the very early stages of design. Uh, the, 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 you can see the form of the, the, the concrete piers, uh, the uh, Virendil grid, uh, and this is, when, this is when it was still a nine, it's a, it's a nine square grid which is subdivided now uh, into four square grids with, within each of the nine squares. It was originally nine and nine, and that's why you had so many, just going back to this, why you had so many steps in the, uh, in the Virendils going out, going out there, uh, cantilevering off the towers, off of the uh, piers rather, which are, there are the piers, there's a typical nine. There's a typical nine-square bay within the greater nine-square of the whole grid. But the real point of this is again the the fact that at, the, at this very early stage he's already looking at what's happening. How do you how do you organize the the systems? And the systems are, to his credit, uh, very well organized. So here you see, there you see a, a nice photo of the, uh, of the the concrete frame in its purity. And there's no other structure besides that. That's it. Everything else is infill. Uh, which gave us a little problem, uh, but not, not an insuperable problem. And then you have the ideal of the structure. There you see, again, the ninth square, the fourth square within it. And that's, but then this is the reality. This is, in the end, what they had to build. They had to, they had to put all these partitions in here. And while Kahn was very good about coming up with a system for the, uh, for the logic of how to do those partitions, he never really wanted them. And it never really, it never really meshed with his original idea of what the building was. So here you see pictures of it going up. Uh, again, they, uh, very, uh, they, those corner posts on the glazing uh, being only glazing stops there. They have no structural purpose whatsoever. Uh, so consequently, the, uh, the concrete has a tendency to creep. The brick has a tendency to push out. And you, we did get distortion. And, that was, and fixing that distortion as we were renovating the curtain wall uh, became one of the more, more interesting challenges that we faced. But you can see it's a very, very literal, even, even in this iteration, which is that this was actually, uh, the, the simplification of this was a result of a value engineering process, which in the end, even Kahn admitted, made the building better, that it was, it was too fussy before. But you see a very literal idea of how these um, diminish as you come up to the corner. So these are right from Kahn's working drawings, and they, 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 they are very, very explicit about how you stack the systems within these Virendil frames. They're not really trusses. They're, they're really frames. You have, a, you have a clear space of about two and a half feet between the top of the bottom cord and the bottom of the top cord in which to run all these systems. But they are incredibly well organized, as this photo, which is really, again, this is, this is the space Kahn wanted. This, is, this, this, this was really his ideal, but you can see, you know, already there are stub ups for, for tables and equipment and eventually partitions that go in across here that, uh, that, that interfere with the purity of that. But even the idea about how you, how you plug in the ceiling lights to make sure that all of the systems are above, we called it, we, we ended up calling this zone between the head of the window here and the sill the sacred zone. So that everything below there came, all the systems came up from the floor and everything above there, they came down from above, but nothing ever crossed that plane in reality. That was, uh, that was not the case, but that was the ideal, and that was what we got back to in our renovation. So here again, uh, I commend this book by Tom Leslie for people who are interested in Khan. Uh, building Art, Building Science, it's one of the most intelligent and insightful works on Khan's. It's very balanced between the philosophy, the aesthetics, and the tech techniques, and uh, it was a great source to us in, t in figuring this out. So here, in, in, as it was uh, nearing completion, but before they put all the interior partitions in, so there, there is kind of the building in its idealized stake, and it's really like a series of stacked vitrines, you know, like, like little modern jewelry boxes. Uh, and then this great picture that was taken by Mildred Schmertz, uh, showing the, uh, obviously, the, the ability to kind of not only uh, work within one of these uh, open areas, but to, to look across and understand what is happening uh, in there. The, he really, Kahn had, uh, had, had this very poetic idea about how scientists work together, which unfortunately just was, was not really realized. And uh, although he simplified the, uh, the exhaust ducts, 
you can see by the height of these and the particular attenuation of the tops, he still wanted to make them this kind of Baroque gesture and really create these, uh, these very, very strong uh, vertical emphases. Uh, because for, even from, from an air quality standpoint, you didn't have to throw the air that far away. Uh, but he really wanted that far as a visual marker. So I mentioned that uh, there was this original idea about, OK, if you are going to put in a partition, uh, you do it along a line of structure. So there you see both the primary and the secondary structure. And this becomes important because it was, frankly, a rule that we had to break in order to make our renovation work for what Penn needed. But it was nonetheless something we paid close attention to. And there is a lot of uh, documentation in the drawings about holding to certain lines. And I, I particularly like this because you can see what you've got here at these doors is they're headless. So that uh, the frame of the door, there's only a jam, and then the header is just the concrete opening. And that way, you don't have two lines when you have, a, when you have the head of a, uh, you have the line of a head of a window and door. It's just one line. Very pure. So you just have this three-quarter inch stop. There's, there's the, uh, that's the head detail. And then a much more typical jam. But I have never seen a building anywhere else where, where someone was that obsessive and that fanatical about uh, maintaining um, a, a datum. But over the years, of course, you went from the ideal that you see here. Here is Kahn with the model from the Museum of Modern Art. And um, it, it got cluttered up. Here you see a lot of things crossing what we call that sacred plane. And these are things that we sort of had to get out. So I'm going to speed up because I'm, I'm running out of time here. But they, here you see this is, th these are in a nutshell what the challenges were and uh, the drivers for the project, the things that, and Century Bond, the, uh, that was if actually, this was a mandate to make the building more energy efficient. But because it's a National Historic Landmark, it, we were, it was deemed that it had to be energy frugal, which means that we had to sort of make our best effort. And I'll talk about that a little bit. These are the goals. And um, looking at the uh, sort of areas of uh, typical upper level areas of significance, the blue are really in some ways the most significant areas because the A, B, and D, the areas that you think would be the most significant in the lab, since they were so cluttered up with these partitions that we knew we had to get rid of, uh, we were able to work with the Park Service to get them to say, OK, it's really the public space that's important here, and that's what we need to improve. So here's a typical sixth floor plan, original on the left. There you can see that's the service tower and then the, uh, the, the, the glazed tower. And then on the right, the scheme that we used to, to, to pull that away. And then the, uh, uh, for looking at, uh, let me just point out right here that there, the lines of structure are here and here. But we actually pulled these back and use a little infill device, which I'll show you in a second, in order to, uh, to close that off, in order to equalize the size of the offices here. So to make, to make a corner office, which used to be that big, uh, and, and, a, and an interior office, which used to be a little tiny thing like that, to equalize them. That was an absolute programmatic dictate. That was the one thing we could not vary from, is everybody had to have equal size spaces. So we found a way to do that by borrowing light Putting, putting, some, uh, putting a second light of glass inside the, the primary light and using non-glare glass so you don't, get, you don't get bounce reflections off of that and pulling these partitions away from the edge. And it also gave us enough room to populate the center with workstations like this. So you were able to get all these graduate students in here. And very important, finally, we always left one corner open so that this idea that when you walk in, to this renovated suite here and look out, you get a sense of the expansiveness of what he was trying to do. The glass was very important. I'll go, again, I'll go through this quickly. Uh, he began to experiment with this uh, a, a sort of break form stainless steel um, uh, uh, glazing system of his own in this building here, the um, uh, AFL Medical Services building. And you see that uh, the developed piece right here, this is a, that's it right there. That's a kind of a, uh, a, a Z-shaped piece. And then uh, the corner mullion. I mentioned that the, the, the sort of sighting down the corner, the idea that this is not, it's not plumb, and therefore uh, 
if that, that, that led to sort of some problems with the fabrication of the glass. It also made it easier to convince Penn that we were really better off not using insulating glass units but using laminated glass, which would have more durability, longer life, and more uh, chance for uh, being able to be cut in these uh, unusual shapes in order to fit the distorted areas. So here's a, here are the details of that. And here you can see the profile of the, of the frame, like that and the actual elevation of these very large pieces of glass. Uh, he had originally uh, designed these uh, sliding screens, which were completely ineffective and eventually were pulled off, but they were originally put on the west and south side of the building uh, called cool shade screens. And then I got very excited about the idea of, could you put a, could you, could you make a thermally broken system out of this? And I think the, the, the serious answer is no, uh, but the dreamer's answer is you should explore whatever you can. And this is a, we did a lot of thinking like this to, to, to try to come up with, even with the solution we did. Uh, and then we even tried this. This is a proposal for a thermally broken frame. We were working on this with uh, Bob Heinchies' office in New York, Loretta Polinsky and Aaron Davis. Uh, and, uh, but we eventually settled on this. Whoops, oh, I'm sorry. We eventually settled on this, which is a high-performance laminated glass, which fit within the original frame, structurally glazed, able to cut to whatever shape we needed for, for to, to accommodate the defor deformations of the buildings, and uh, gave them a reasonable increase in uh, energy performance. But very importantly, though, we now were able to seal the building up really tight and use a very high-performance HVAC system. Uh, there, this is from the guidelines reminding anybody who ever works on this building in the future about how this whole idea of stacking the systems that Khan originally designed really works. And then we put in these chill beam systems. We're able to use chill beams which are much more energy efficient than a, v a VAV system. And that is where we really realized the savings. Uh, so it's not, it's not the ideal. Our baseline was here to start out with. Our optimum, uh, the, the very best we could have done with the chill beams and an IGU is right here, but we got to, uh, we got to about 80% of that. And we feel that, that, is a, that that's, a, that's a good balance considering the architectural quality of the building. But again, it's sort of putting all that together to make sure you come up with the, with the, optimal, uh, the optimal solution. So that's what these are, these adaptive solutions. And in coming up then with a, um, with a system to, uh, to build out this thing. We said, okay, we have to, we have to, we have to, we're inventing something new. We have to, uh, uh, we're gonna work off of Khan's language and there was a sort of a decision that we would be uh, distinctive uh, and different, but not radically different. And we looked to Khan's own work for precedent. This is the, this sort of the typical kind of oak and uh, either mill finish aluminum or stainless steel that he uses at the Yale Center for British Art, but also this idea of offsetting partitions, because I mentioned that we had to offset the partitions in order to, in order to, to right-size the offices. That was something Kahn did himself, where he takes a line of structure here at the Kimball Museum, he offsets using the same kind of bent stainless steel plate, offsets a partition here and here, and actually creates a room in between. So within the structure, he, he, he pulls that out enough to have a, a, a bonus space that occupies the actual line of destruction. We thought, well, this is, this is a great sort of pragmatic uh, precedent to be able to use in coming up with our system. So there is again, uh, looking again at this diagram, looking at the corner, that's what this is right here. There's the glass inside of the uh, larger light of glass there. And then the primary lines of the structure and then here and here, and here, and here, where we pull that out in order to uh, make that work. And that, that is done with these panels that you see right here. That is, and there is actually a precedent within the building in a storage area where he had used, uh, in his case, asbestos cement panels to offset some partitions from the grid. Uh, we used a matte finish aluminum, which looks just like an asbestos cement panel, but it isn't, of course. Uh, and it also gave us the opportunity to put in some additional lighting. 
From a conservation standpoint, we gave the concrete just a very, very light wash, a couple of, uh, couple of washes with uh, simple green. We made no effort to uh, take a lot of the soiling and staining off uh, that, that, that wouldn't come off with a simple wash because we wanted it to be part of the patina of the building. And it actually, it, there is this uh, wonderful glow that happens uh, because of that. And then um, this idea here that we created these lounge spaces by taking away closets and making this now space big enough to serve as an anteroom for the laboratories themselves. And in order to accommodate a whole raft of new systems which had to go above here, we took another idea from Khan's own sketches, which was to create a kind of a shroud, a hanging shroud in which to embed some lights and to provide some screening for the work above. Now, this is all, this is all mesh, so if you're sitting here and looking up, you can see the stuff above it and be aware of what's going on. But it gives it a little bit of a finish to the space. And there you see just uh, restored areas. And the use of these vertical radiation units where they used to be, there had been no heat there to begin with. They discovered that they had to put heat at these windows at some point, and they had these pedestals, but the pedestals interrupted the floor-to-ceiling view of the window, so we decided to use these rentals instead. And that's basically it. So I think since I have run over, I was going to do a little more, but I think I'm going to call it there and open it up for questions, and thank you all very, very much. Questions? Comments? No? People are hungry and tired, I know. There was an, there was an image that you had for a short of photograph, which is short drapes in the building. Is that part of the original uh, thing? No. Yeah, and actually, again, I, 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 unfortunately, I know I got a little. I got a little ahead of my, uh, uh, or behind myself, I should say. But what that is, that was to illustrate this building had horrible solar problems, horrible. And people tried desperately anything. And I love that picture. That's a, and that, that picture was actually taken by Julia Schulman. Uh, and these, no, this is, a, people use mylar. People use different kinds of blinds. And in this case, they actually hung drapes up there. But that was, it was, it was every, every principal investigator for themselves in terms of the says We have, um, in our renovation, we developed a Meco shade, not only a Meco shade system, but a Meco shade hanging system that works with Khan's stainless steel framing system, which I think actually came out very elegantly. And now, now they, have, they all have Meco shades that they can use, and it's, it's much better. They also have better cooling. Okay, we were awarded the project in 2011. We really got underway the end of 2011, 2012. We spent about a year and a half in design, maybe, t yeah, about a year and a half in design and testing. Uh, and then it was built between, the first phase was built between 2014 and the end of 2015. The, s the last phases were just completed about a year ago. So it's a long, a long pro We interviewed for the project in, uh, yeah, we interviewed in the very beginning of 2011. One of the things that's amazing to me, uh, it's, it's, been, it's been clear, you know, the concept of preserving that zone, and that that's the guy who holds the roof. Probably going to do, or let's say, be more liberal with mm -hmm. things like our nuclear housing and the plant, for instance, like creating a corner like that. So I wonder, you know, talk a little bit about the importance of developing some, uh, some guidelines for yourself um, in a project like this or others that you work on. Well, um, no, that was, I mean, that was very important. One of the things that uh, we got very excited about, I mean, it, it, there's a whole book to be written about the development of cons way of glazing buildings. I have a longer version of this, which goes, which compares it with the, the, which brings in the Salk Institute and the Yale Center for British Art, and how he was constantly refining and um, making more robust this, this system. So we felt honoring that system was, was part of, so fortunately, in the end, it was so well built that we had no problem restoring it. We had to 
correct some distortions, but we had no problem restoring. But then the question really became, I, I bring up this slide because it was, how do you, what do you use for a system? What is the right way to do this? And there was, there was no hard and fast guidance except for the old laboratory entrances. And frankly, what we did is, and this is, call this cheating or not, but what we did was we took, we took the original design that Khan used for the interior entrances to these lab suites, which was also a, a break, form of brake metal. Uh, he wasn't clear in, uh, in the drawings whether it was stainless or just painted hollow metal. But it wasn't a typical hollow metal system, which is what they put in. So we found these drawings, and then we found big voids, big X, out, out, out. And in the end, he put, they, they, they put in a much heavier and more commonplace hollow metal, typical hollow metal frame, and, you know, with a, with a wood door. So there, we developed from this a few principles. We said, all right, we want to honor the idea of the, the brake metal. Now, we actually tried doing a custom system here. That, in the end, did not work. But what we did do is we did find the one steel interior partition manufacturer who could do something sort of like what we were after. And, uh, but again, do it in a way that is contemporary, that's clearly not Louis Kahn, but that we felt had, a, had more empathy with the, the, the detailing ideas that went into the rest of the glazing of the building. The other thing we did is we decided that everything had to be one material from the floor up to the underside of the truss. So if it was glass, it was all glass. If it was wood, it was all wood. I mean, you know, the, uh, a lot of the professor says, well, we want windows on our doors. And we all we said, we finally we said, no, that's, we, we don't feel that that is, uh, that, that, you know, it, it, it there's an, I, there was a, a, a rigor in Khan's scheme. And even though there were doors with windows in the original building, they don't appear on his drawings. There, there, it, it is, again, so we, we said we're going to do this in a way because that we feel um, lends some of the, uh, try, tries to capture some of the rigor of Kahn's architecture uh, in, in a way that we see as appropriate. It's subjective. I mean, I can't, I can't tell you, again, that it's right or wrong, but it felt right to us. To us, I mean, it, it, these are... These were design decisions, and we, you know, you putting this all together, this all kind of felt right. And fortunately, most of the people who have walked through it and reviewed it, and subsequently afterwards, have agreed with us. So we were, we, we, I guess we got this one right. But it's, and it's surprising. And we even to the point where we, uh, where we, where we built these the doors and wood panels. We we even cribbed the detail of just using the stop at the head without without running the frame across the head. And we felt that was a, that in, and that we would honor Khan because I think anybody else looking at this, you know, looking at it from any other angle, you would, you would never suspect, you would never confuse it with what Khan had done originally. But that's, I know, it, it was, uh, we had a, we, there, there was a, there was a lot of debate. And I have to tell you, I mean, one of, <laughs> the, our, our chief lab planner, when I proposed this, that we were going to move off the grid and put these things in, he almost quit. He said, this is really Khan, you can't do that. This, this is a, preservation is a highly emotional discipline. I mean, there are peop people get very, very excised about, uh, about what is right and what is wrong. And that's, that's why I say there is no right and wrong. You just, it's whatever you can best justify. And you just look at, look at the grand scheme of things and hit your, hit your optimum point. Anybody else? Yeah. You showed a diagram of the, the stacking of the Yes. Unfortunately, we, uh, we did for some of the piping, but for the most, what I should say, you know, the, the one thing I didn't say, which, uh, which I realized in my haste, um, we changed the function of this building fundamentally. We changed it from a wet lab to a center for cognitive neuroscience. So all of a sudden, you didn't, we didn't need the vast amount of air changes that were required of the original building. So that, that made our job a lot easier in terms of the uh, HVAC. So it was new systems, but there we did have a, um, 
we did our best to honor the spirit of what Kahn did. Kahn actually put in something called seamless ductwork. And the se seamless ductwork is a very expensive, very exotic way of doing uh, exposed ductwork. Uh, in the end, we couldn't afford that, but we, but we got the next best thing, which was, a, which, which, which was something very close to that. But we had to, it was, the one, it was the one time we actually had to go back and have the contractor completely redo something because they just, they, 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 they weren't getting it quite right. So that stuff was very important. And to your point, if we could have saved it, we would have, but we were so radically changing the sizes and configurations. But the spirit of how it stacks is the same. That layering idea didn't change in our scheme. Anyone else? I just want to ask you about some of the other, the GSA and other buildings. Yeah. Uh, they were changing the way that they look. They did. That, 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 that GSA building I gave you, change, it absolutely it changes changed. the way so it looks. What was the sort of reaction from the general public much more the latter than the former yeah much more the latter than the former I'm sure there are some people who were nostalgic for the old Celebrezzi building but not much remember this is a building that of no great architectural significance you you, you don't pay fast and play fast and loose with this with a lot of buildings but no they saw it as a uh, generally as You've, made, you've modernized it. You've made it new. Modernization, I, I don't know how much any of you have heard this term being thrown around these days, but with so much renovation work going on, uh, an awful lot of people, they, nobody calls it preservation. They call it modernization. And uh, e even a lot of preservation projects are called modernizations. It seems to ring true with people. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you. Thank you.